Welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining me. My name is Jenna Mittelmeyer. I'm a lecturer in international education at the University of Manchester. Um, I recently gave a masterclass um, at a conference at the University of Glasgow that was looking at how to develop research about international students without using deficit narratives. Um, and there were a few people who reached out to me afterwards and, and asked um, if they could learn more about the session. So I thought I would just do a quick recording, um, re-recording of the session in case it's of use to anyone who is doing research research with international students and is wondering, you know, what a deficit narrative is and, and how they might um, avoid that in their research. Um, while I'm speaking, I'll refer to several links, um, but I'll also include um, a link to the slides um, either in the comments or if you're watching this on, on WordPress in the post um, so that you can follow along and, and follow up with any links as well. So um, what I'll do today is I'll kind of talk through, you know, what a deficit narrative is. Um, and describe a little bit about why um, deficit narratives are problematic. And then I'll follow up with some practical suggestions for how you might avoid a deficit narrative about international students in your work. Um, but let's start first by what I mean by the phrase deficit narrative, because I think that's really important to understand the rest of the session. Um, so when I say deficit narrative, what I mean is that there's a tendency for research about international students to do um, kind of two different things. So first, uh, research might position international students as lacking um, particular skills that are deemed necessary for success. So, for example, I often hear assumptions about international students lacking critical thinking skills, participation skills, um, or language competencies. So a deficit narrative um, is when we frame our research around that sense of what international students are perceived to lack or assumptions about their deficiencies in, in um, skill sets or prior experiences. Um, and oftentimes that's particularly um, particularly framed as what it is that's believed that international students lack compared to home students or to this kind of normative vision of what a higher education student should be. Um, another way that the deficit narrative is portrayed is through solely framing international students' experiences um, through the lens of struggle, um, through these assumptions that international students only experience challenges or, or barriers. So I often see research you know, that focuses on, on the challenges faced by international students in the classroom or in their social network building, um, which you know, I think then fails to capture the more um, positive or, or nuanced experiences, which are just as important to our understanding. So a deficit narrative is this really negative framing that makes assumptions about who international students are um, what they're perceived or assumed to lack um, and what their experiences are assumed to be like. Um, and this comes from a really negative place about um, assumptions of their deficiencies or, or assumed inadequacies. Um, I'll talk more in a moment about why a deficit narrative is problematic, but I think this really, um, you know, I, I think this kind of framing sees international students in a really limited way um, that fails to capture the, the nuances of their holistic experiences. So international students are, are no longer presented as complex human beings, um, but as students who lack skills and struggle through a really narrow vision. Um, and this is a narrative you know, that's presented time and time again in the literature um, and in practice. Um, that's my dog coughing, sorry. Um, but I think you know, it, it um, you know, frames our, our field, forms a foundation to our field. Um, and um, you know, I think sometimes this is explicit, um, but also it could be implicit in kind of the subtle framing or the language um, that's used to describe international students' experiences. And once you start to, to notice this, you'll find this framing of international students is really pervasive. So um, that's kind of a, um, a suggestion when you're reading an article next about international students to think about, you know, where are you seeing um, deficit narratives and where might this study be framed from a deficit perspective? Um, these are just some examples from the literature. Um, I've only presented the titles because I don't want to name and shame specific authors because I see this as a really um, systemic issue across the field, which is present at all levels, um, often accidentally. I would say even in my own research, when I look back on some of my own writing, I see these deficit narratives. 
Um, but you can see just from the title, that framing of deficit, that international students face challenges as global learners. They have problems with critical thinking. They struggle with local community participation. They have language difficulties. Um, and you know, these weren't articles that I had to search very hard to find. They, they are everywhere within the literature, even amongst um, the most critical researchers. So I'd encourage you um, to, again, have a little challenge when you're reading a piece of research about international students. Think about where you're seeing deficit um, in the way international students are framed or written about, because the more that you start to see it, the more that you can be self-critical in your own research as well. Um, just to illustrate that pervasiveness, here's a screenshot from Google Scholar's autofill search. So if you just type in international students language, you'll see a whole host of deficit suggestions. Um, you know, we see here barrier, problems, uh, difficulties, challenges, anxiety, stress. Um, I think, you know, this is really illustrative of how deeply entrenched this framing is to the foundation of our research field. Um, you know, it's almost as if when we talk about language and international students, our first reaction is to think about struggle and difficulty, rather than characterizing um, the resilience it takes to learn another language or the value that multilingualness brings into our learning experiences or into our academic spaces. Um, so I've probably already started to hint at this, um, but I find this deficit framing of international students really problematic and at times unethical. Um, you know, I think there's many, many reasons why. I'll try to keep it short in this particular video. Um, and, and what I've done is narrow down to what I think are the three most important issues. Um, so the first is that deficit narratives position international students as others. Um, so you might have come across this concept of othering um, based on the work of Edward Said and his conceptualization of Orientalism. Um, but what, you know, what othering means is the construction of categories of us and them. And those in the us category are considered the norm and those in the them category are categorized as different or inferior, um, you know, often linked with, with problematic issues of, of racism and xenophobia. So a deficit narrative of international students is underpinned by all of these assumptions that international students are inferior, less skilled, um, or, or not normal. And that, I think, is a really problematic framing that positions international students as lower quality students. The second um, is that you know, the deficit narrative shows a really limited picture of international students' experiences. So as a, a former international student myself, I can certainly agree, you know, there were aspects of the, that experience that were challenging or difficult. Um, and, you know, of course, it's important and, and even essential for our contributions to knowledge to, to recognize and, and to critically reflect on those problems. Um, but I think, um, you know, a lot of our research is actually driven by seeing only those barriers. Um, and you know, might come from a place of wanting to develop greater justice and support. But I think you know, that my experience and, and the experiences of other international students wasn't wholly defined by those challenges. Um, and in fact, you know, there were wonderful moments of things like transformation, of resilience, of personal growth, of meaningful intercultural interactions and intercultural learning. And so when we frame our research only around the struggle, we're missing um, the aspects that make international study meaningful. So deficit narratives mean, you know, we're left with only a partial representation of, of international students' experiences. Um, and then finally, deficit narratives come from a place of assumed assimilation, that there is an expected norm in the place where students study and that international students need to be the ones to change and adapt to fit that norm. Um, and, you know, I think I would argue that we should instead be operating from a place of mutual transformation where our teaching pedagogies and our university supports are, are meeting international students halfway. Um, so there's, you know, a need um, for there to be a recognition in our teaching process 
um, that we need to be inclusive in, of international difference and that universities um, need to also be changing and adapting their institutional spaces where um, to make spaces you know, where international students are welcome and, and can thrive. And so I think a deficit narrative puts that burden or pressure really unfairly on students themselves um, to change through assumptions um, that you know, encountered barriers are due to their own deficiencies rather than systemic problems that fail to include them. So um, now that we can hopefully recognize that deficit narratives exist, um, our next step is to think about how we can avoid them within our work. Um, and my feeling is that as researchers and, and creators of knowledge, we have an ethical duty to portray international students' experiences as multifaceted and complex, rather than solely through the lens of deficit, um, you know, which only shows a partial and a really problematic picture. So um, limited by time, I've narrowed down to six suggestions to reflect on in your own work. Um, and I think, you know, just in outlining these, it's important to say this isn't meant to be exhaustive or um, a step-by-step how-to guide, um, but hopefully it's a starting point, um, you know, to give you some reflection points to, to, to take away into your own research designs or into developing the presentation of your findings. So the first um, is to widen the focus of our research. Um, so I see pretty often research proposals that are fully framed from the position of deficit by focusing only on challenges. And what that approach does is that it immediately closes off any potential of seeing international students' experiences in a more holistic or balanced way. So if you position your research about challenges, you'll never be able to capture those more positive or nuanced experiences, um, even though you know, those aspects of the experience are just as important to understanding um, international students' experiences as they are the struggles. So I think an easy way to check for this is to think about your title of your research. If it contains the word challenges, struggles, difficulties, or any other synonym, um, I would usually say it's probably time to change your title and to critically reflect on you know, whether you're approaching your research from a deficit perspective. Um, and as we can see with the example here on the screen, um, that we can start to shift that focus just by widening the scope of what we want to capture in our study. So rather than international students' challenges with academic writing, we can focus on international students' multifaceted experiences with academic writing. Um, and this second research project would you know, allow us to still capture those hurdles or barriers, but we can also reflect on where academic writing might be enjoyable or intellectually transformative. Um, so we can start to see the other side of that experience. Um, we can start to understand you know, how the process of um, developing academic writing might actually support learning and you know, where there might be instances of good practice that can be transferred into other settings. So you know, these are still really um, important and valuable contributions to knowledge as much as the recognition of, um, of the challenges. The next thing we can do is we can start to shift um, you know, who's to blame, so to speak, when we do record those barriers or challenges. So let's take the example of language. Um, in our research, we might find that language difficulties are a barrier to academic success for some international students. And I think the easy assumption is to make that a personal problem on behalf of international students, that they lack the required language skills to be successful. Um, but what I would encourage us to do is to instead start to see that as a shared issue rather than a burden that's fully placed on international students. So international students are admitted to a university with a certain tested English level. So that blame should actually rest on universities. Um, you know, it's not that international students are unskilled. Um, the problem is actually that the admission criteria isn't aligned with the academic expectations. Um, and we could also argue that 
universities don't always recognize the value of linguistic diversity or provide um, support mechanisms or pedagogic interventions or pedagogic recognitions um, to uplift students with different linguistic backgrounds or to um, recognize the value of contributions from students from different tested language levels. So we can start to shift that blame away from the individual and we can start to see a more complex picture. Related to that, um, we can start to see these problems not as individual issues, but as wider systemic issues. So another common issue that rises in the literature is about international students and friendship networks. Um, and I often see this framed as international students facing difficulties with um, making friendships with home students. Um, and this approach um, you know, frames this as an individual problem or an individual failure that international students aren't trying hard enough, they're not outgoing enough, they're too different from the norms or home students aren't welcome enough. But I think we could also reflect on this alternatively as a, a systemic issue within the university. So we've already had decades of research that shows us these divisions exist on university campuses around the world. So we can actually shift that narrative um, to a more systemic issue that universities are fundamentally places that encourage division rather than encouraging meaningful intercultural explain, um, exchange. So we can be critical here and we can argue that universities have failed to develop structures and opportunities that contribute to opportunities to develop meaningful intercultural relationships. So within your own work, my advice is to think about whether, whether there are um, you know, wider systemic issues that might help explain the findings that you're developing. So thinking beyond the individual and placing those findings into the wider systems where their experiences take place. Um, the next thing I would argue is that research about international students is often highly under theorized. Um, and what I mean by that is I often see research proposals that focus broadly on international students' experiences without really defining what is meant by that word experience or conceptualizing specifically, uh, you know, what about that experience is in focus. Um, and I think, you know, this framing can mean so many different things as, you know, the concept of experiences are, are complex and multifaceted and are incorporating dozens of different ideas or facets. Um, so without a theoretical framing to guide researchers into what specifically they're looking for, um, there's a tendency for um, a, a tendency for you know our own individual biases to start to take precedence um, and for us to accidentally hone in on these deficit experiences and fail to see the wider experiences that they um, take place within. Um, we might also you know fail to see international students as individuals with agency or resilience. So um, theoretical frameworks play such an important role in framing how international students and their experiences are seen in the research, um, you know, supporting researchers to see those experiences more holistically and to see individuals as more um, nuanced human beings. So, I mean, I think there's certainly not enough time to go through all of these verbatim, and this is just a short example of some of the theoretical frameworks that you might draw into your research with international students, certainly not comprehensive. Um, but, you know, here are just some examples of theoretical frameworks that might help us situate this work against deficit narratives. Um, and I've included some links to kind of get you started on, on the reading of any of interest. But I think a key takeaway is to purposely reflect on the question, you know, how does your theoretical framework support your work in shifting away from a deficit narrative? Um, we can also think about our research designs and whether they allow for student voice and student agency and sharing the complexity of their experiences kind of beyond our own narrow biases that may um, 
accidentally lean towards deficit. So thinking about are the methods we're using capturing nuance and complexity? Um, you know, again, this could be an entire session on its own, but you know, some consideration might be the inclusion of creative research methods or co-creation research methods or reflective methods like diaries, which center voice um, and allow opportunities for individuals to raise those nuanced com um, reflections. And we might think about longitudinal research, which sees development over time and how experiences grow and change and shape over the course of a program um, of experiences, not just narrow, narrowly focused on um, you know, one specific moment in time or thinking about mixed method research, which allow that triangulation of seeing and experience from multiple facets. Um, so, you know, I think a key takeaway here is reflecting on how does your research design purposefully seek to avoid deficit? You know, what are the checks and balances you're putting into your research design to avoid deficit? Um, how does your data collection see problems as holistic? and collect data from multiple angles. Um, and yeah, how, how has this been purposefully built into your design process? Um, and then finally, and maybe the easiest, um, is to reflect on the way that we're writing about international students. So one simple consideration is the use of hedging, where we just add that tiny recognition that experiences do not represent all individuals. So I see this often um, in writing about international students where authors say international students face linguistic barriers. Um, and that's such a wide sweeping statement that all international students always experience barriers. That's a really strong definitive deficit statement that makes wide generalizations across a really large and diverse group of people. Um, but just by adding a few words, like some international students may at times experience, um, we can show our recognition that barriers at times exist, but that they don't always apply to all individuals or in all circumstances. So um, in summary, um, deficit narratives are pervasive to the research about international students and their experiences. Um, you know, I would argue that it's part of our ethical duty as researchers to be cognizant of this and to purposefully push against this in our research designs and in the framing of our studies um, and in our writing. So to me, ethical research with international students is, is research that sees the complexity and nuance in their experience um, that reflects on you know, their intersectional experiences beyond just their status um, as international students, you know, seeing them as full and complex human beings. Um, I think ethical research also frames international students' experiences as multifaceted, um, containing a wide range of experiences and emotions that aren't just wholly negative um, and are more well-rounded and nuanced. Um, and ethical research sees problems not as a blame of an individual, but situated within systemic barriers, shifting you know, the blame away from um, individuals and more towards systems. So I think you know, we have to start to see the systemic issues of xenophobia and racism that are present within international students' experiences. Um, that's again, part of our ethical imperative as researchers. So, um, you know, I would encourage all of you as researchers to bring in that level of criticality and awareness to see deficit narratives when you come across them in the literature so that you can start to recognize them in your own work, um, to question the extent to which your own work is framed from a deficit perspective, to really have it actively on, on the forefront of your mind, um, and to actively work towards adopting that more holistic approach within your data collection. So perhaps you know, a reflection piece for after you watch this, to go away, uh, reflect on where deficit narratives might be present within your own research and within your writing and thinking about, you know, what can you do to purposefully step away from that and develop a, a check and balance system to frame your work differently.
So if you're interested in learning more about this or you'd like to develop more criticality in this area, um, my colleague Sylvie Lomer and I have created a critical reading list for researchers in the area of internationalization of higher education. Um, it contains at the moment 72 key articles um, that I feel anyone who does research in this area should read and engage with to develop criticality and anti-deficit narrative in their in their work. So please do um, take a look and have a browse. Um, I'll include the link alongside this video. But with that said, um, thank you kindly for watching. Um, I look forward to seeing how your research develops.